It's spooky season. I'm Sydney Stallworth from today in St. Louis and for the past couple of years I've been visiting some of the spookiest spots in Missouri and Illinois from Zombie Road to Limp Brewery. Here are some of the top terrifying places I've been to. It's eerie. It's possibly possessed. It's a bed and breakfast. Believe it or not, the Lehman House, a B&B in Lafayette Square, is listed as one of the most haunted hotels in the state. Uh, I don't tell people, I don't like to use the word haunted because that conjures up um, the meanness and the viciousness of like the Amityville horror movies. Uh, it's not like that at all. It's, it's a benevolent presence, whatever it is, it just is. The house becomes a home away from home for thousands of living visitors every year, but the supernatural guests don't seem to be checking out anytime soon. I was here on a Saturday with the plumber and I heard what clearly sounded like a man with hard soled shoes walking down the hallway. And again, the house is empty. It sounded like a wagon being pulled across, something with wheels being pulled across a hardwood floor. The odd thing was though, that room was carpeted. I was afraid of what it, that I didn't know what it was, but I wasn't afraid it, we would be, ever be threatened by it. And there was one night where I swear to God, I woke up and I saw him standing at my dresser. Edward Rowe is just one of the three owners of the house who died here. And somehow that didn't stop Marie from buying this place twice. She has stories for days and so do some of her guests. I mean, this place will take a skeptic and turn you in, into a believer. Opened in 1867, the original Springs Hotel has had thousands of people walk the halls. Some maybe never left. The ghosts really keep it interesting for us around here. It wasn't just what was in the hotel that attracted guests from around the country. It was what flowed underneath it. The hotel is famous for its mineral water, and when it comes to supernatural sightings, workers in the hotel have stories for days, like a strange moment in the empty bathhouse. Whenever we walked in, I said, do you hear water? And she's like, yeah, I was like, oh, that's weird. Like this whole part was flipped up because it both is like cold and one, one's cold, one's hot. So the whole, this part turned and like this was flipped up, shooting water out. And a scary sight from behind the bar. I was doing dishes just at the sink and it was literally just like, I could just see them walking down the hallway. Yeah. Yeah, that's scary. And, it, and no one's there. And I have seen somebody all dressed in black on the balcony around the pool. Just, and again, no faces, just like, you can see it's a human form. Many believe a former owner of the hotel and her son are among the spirits still hanging around. One of the spirits they say, you'll, you'll hear there's a, a lady in white, and they believe that's Mrs. Sheerbaum. A woman who claimed she gained the ability to walk again after bathing in the mineral water, convinced her husband to buy the hotel and ran it with her family. They say just over a third of the guests who come to check in are interested in all things paranormal, but luckily they haven't had any dangerous encounters just yet. In Oakville, Sydney Stallworth, five on your side. The McPike Mansion is one of the most notorious paranormal places in Alton, a town known nationwide for its supernatural sightings. Sharon Lutke says she didn't know the home was haunted when she bought it back in the 90s, but she found out pretty quickly. The first thing that happened to me was I tripped on some boards and bricks in this uh, double parlor over here, and actually I felt a tug on, the warm, on my warm-up jacket. It was on the side, so really I think they were trying to keep me from falling. I got this big chill as I walked through between the two trees out there and I looked up and I saw a man in the window. The mansion built in 1867 is rumored to be home to quite a few ghostly guests. There's uh, probably 10 or 12 spirits altogether that we've, you know, identified or, or feel like we've identified. Uh, Henry's here, of course, and I think because he is his house, he wants, you know, he 
he wants to fix up and he loves it. And then um, Mary, his first wife, is here. The main levels of the house are closed off, but Sharon still gives ghost tours of the property. People who come to experience the mansion generally want to see one area, the cellar. Guests summon the spirits during seances there, so of course we had to check it out. So we sit down here in the dark and we, like I said, we show people how to use the dowsing rods and we ask yes or no questions of the spirits. And uh, sometimes people get touched, sometimes we smell things. Well, we've seen some pretty spooky spots during the month of October and McPike Mansion is no exception. I've got to say, I think our haunted tour has turned this skeptic into a believer. Was not a believer before, totally a believer now. Alex Matushek takes us back to 2013, when after a horseback ride, she went for a late night walk in Wildwood at what's now known as Merrimack Greenway, home to a series of trails like the Al Foster and Rock Hollow trails, but people in that area know it as Zombie Road. There's stories that everyone has heard of this trail, and my aunt was in town, so we said, you know, we might as well just go check it out. We were definitely a little bit further down. This trail goes back quite a ways. Um, it was not paved when we were walking the trail originally, so the brush was very hot. Late at night, this supernatural skeptic, and I never really believed it, I was like, whatever, started feeling some strange sensations. There were like pockets of colder air. Then a sound she'll never forget. We hear kind of this high-pitched squeal almost, um, sounding like it was from either a young girl or maybe a teenage girl, young woman. Um, and simultaneously, as we hear that sound, my, I feel this sharp pain on my leg. Alex and her aunt hurry from the woods. When she gets home, a sinister surprise. There was scratches on my leg. Alex says she was wearing layers and riding chaps all untorn. She assumes whatever scratched her wasn't of this world. I don't know any physical possible way how I could have gotten scratched without there being some kind of marking on my on my half chap leather or any kind of marking on my pants or my sock, no tears, no nothing. It wouldn't be the first time something inexplicable happened here. See how it move. That's gone. A documentary, Children of the Grave, by the Booth Brothers with Spooked Productions, shows a paranormal team out at night with cameras along Zombie Road. I spoke with Christopher Booth, who shares this footage with me of what he calls a shadow nest of children between the trees. The images were captured about six miles into the forest. Some say the original Zombie Road sits on one of the largest Native American burial grounds in the country and is occupied by spirits of indigenous people, Confederate soldiers, children, industrial workers, the list goes on. I talked with a representative from St. Louis County Parks who urges you not to go out searching for anything on or around the trails at night. The trails close before sunset and wandering around the woods is obviously dangerous. And I'm not really into the paranormal kind of stuff, never really believed in it until this experience. I mean, not everything I, can, I see in the paranormal I can explain. Dr. Mark Farley, founder of the St. Louis Paranormal Research Society, has seen quite a few things that defy explanation at the Seven Gates. There was like three or four shadow figures that were standing on top. Yeah, you could, in the, it was a full moon that night, and you could see them. We shined our flashlight up there, and we saw them, and we just left. I said, oh, no. It's time to go. <laughs> it's time to go. Yeah. I, the Seven Gates are a system of railroad trestles outside Collinsville. According to the urban legend, if you drive through all seven gates, and you drive through all seven gates and approach the seventh gate at midnight, you're supposed to be transported back into hell. Or some demonic creature would come and greet you. I've heard that version of the story too. We had to drive through gate one, then gate two to meet Dr. Farley between gates three and four, a place he says is a hotbed for paranormal activity. This is why I saw the ball of light that kind of moved, followed the train down into the creek bed, came back up and went out of sight. And another thing that was really weird here, years ago, we would always find animal carcasses, dogs, deer, strewn through here. 
and you would be here at night and you would hear dogs barking. And it always seemed like the dogs were getting closer, almost like they were on top of you. And they never come. That's the story that people talk about hellhounds. And people in Collinsville have definitely been talking. Many come out at night, especially around this time of year, to get a glimpse at something ghostly. People have been out here numbering the gates. You can see which one is which, and clearly there's an interest. <coughs> yeah, I mean, for years, people have spray painted these gates. Whether you believe the rumors or not, the gates are dangerous for another very real reason. What is that? Also, yeah. A lot of kids would be down here, a lot of teenagers would be in the middle of the night, and people fly down this road at night, and kids have been hit. Dr. Farley says he has a photo of a spirit at the spot a car crashed on the side of gate four. I have a picture of an apparition. You can see her in a hoodie standing like that. Turns out Collinsville has a couple of celestial corners on the outskirts of the city. About 10 minutes down the road and past gates five and six, we come to Acid Bridge. Just got that feeling here that you are never alone. With your spooky spot, I'm Sydney Stallworth, five on your side. Do you like to watch the shows here at the Fox? That's a strong yes. <laughs> yep, that's me using dousing rods to talk to ghosts inside the Fox Theater. Now you may be wondering how I got here. I know I am. But nothing could have prepared me for this. So I've seen one spirit but felt countless. So rumor is there are ghosts inside Fox Theater. Some have been here before the main stage was even built. And we captured our one of the best apparitional shots I've ever seen right here in seat H11. And it's a lady just sitting here like she's watching the show. And we think this goes back to the McClure family who had a mansion here at one time. Some spirits like Anna sitting up high in the mezzanine. She was the caretaker for the church that used to be on this land, the Grand Presbyterian Church. And people describe her the same every time. They're, I just saw a lady in a green dress. Seeing the theater with the house lights on is enough to take your breath away. That's if the spirits who live here don't take it away first. You could see the ghost of a maintenance person who walks up and down this hall jingling his keys. One of my investigators snapped a photo over here and they captured his apparition and it's pretty amazing to see. Strange happenings in the tunnels underneath the stage. I've walked through here with mediums before and one gentleman literally keeps his hand out because there's so much traffic. He said the hallways are filled with people in costumes, in overalls who are working the show with lighting people, and they're just constantly coming up and down the hallway. Arlene says two employees came into this dressing room. When they tried to leave, the doors were locked shut. They started to scream for help. But the master key, which is, works everywhere in this theater, couldn't get these doors open. Finally, the maintenance man ripped the doorknob off this door to get the girls out. It's never been put back on because they swore we're never doing this again. Fox Theater has brought in experts like Dr. Mark Farley and countless mediums to find out which spirits are living here. We've been able to communicate with so many that they'll tell us their name. So we have Jeffrey, who's probably our most popular one. Another spirit isn't as friendly. William, the poltergeist, lives up in the projection room. He's super strong, he's super powerful. Anna and a few other spirits decided to show up for our interview. Do you see Sydney? Will you point them at her? My hands aren't moving. So you know I had to try this for myself. They'll cross them for yes, and they'll do this if they want, if they're saying no to me. Okay, are you guys friendly? Do you like to watch the shows here at the Fox? That's a strong yes. <laughs> I'm really not gotta, moving it. She's not. I'm really not. Your elbows would be like a chicken. Yeah, you I'm really not it. moving it, Joe. It's crazy. It's it's okay. It's insane. Next time you see a show at Fox Theater, come with your eyes and mind wide open and look beyond the lights on the stage. You may just see something you can't explain. With your spooky spots, I'm Sydney Stallworth, five on your side. over the water.
can you'll see the bodies fl um, floating. A lot of urban legends are rooted in truth. Rooted in truth and grown into a ghost story for the ages. For Mark Farley, the legend of Hernando's Bridge near Millstadt started in 1874. It's one of the most notorious cold cases in the Metro East, the Saxtown Massacre. This was had such a stigma in this area that the sound, town of Saxtown um, basically disbanded and mainly Millstadt took over as the, mo as the most popular town here in this area. Unsolved axe murders, rumors of dark spirits, Saxtown developed a wicked reputation. The urban legend goes there was a farmer by the name of Her Hernando and he fell in love with the Saxtown witch and he would not leave his family to run off with her. The witch got jealous cursed Hernando and basically he hung his family from when this was a trestle bridge, hung them from the trestles. Hence, the legend of Hernando's bridge was born. The slaughter in Saxtown dates back nearly 150 years with a supernatural impression, residents say, you can still see today. So to see what it's rumored that you'll see, you have to come out here. Come out here on a full moon. Full moon, full moon. Yeah, that's well. You know what? All paranormal things happen on full moon. Right? Yeah. And then what you do is right here. You just brace your knee up. And you look over the water, and you can you'll see the bodies um, floating. Rumor has it visitors see four shadows in the water. The shadows of Hernando's hung family. Shadows or stories. They come here specifically to see what they want to see. That's up to you to decide. With your spooky spot, I'm Sydney Stallworth, five on your side. Any home that has skulls in the walls makes people worried and a little concerned. Welcome to the Jerome Mansion, the oldest brick home in Illinois and former home to Henry Jerome. When it was finished in 1810, this was a mansion like no other. But if these walls could talk today. I just want to know about, are there two horse skulls that are up in the attic space? I'm sorry, yep. what? Yep, so there are two here and there are four total that were found in the house when we did the restoration. Horse skulls, yes, you heard that right. So you can see how this house gets its haunted rep. Mark Farley, founder of the St. Louis Paranormal Research Society says he'll never forget what he saw outside the home at night as a teenager. Went right across the um, upper windows, second story window. It looked like a candle. Someone was walking across with a candle. We all teamed up to search for the facts amidst decades of folklore. Wow. And you never felt anything strange here? Never really felt anything strange. The house creaks, but of course it creaks, right? There's older homes. One of the most notorious local legends, the area under the staircase. Was this used as a quarantine room? No, that's the stairs to the basement. Oh, really? Yeah. So the house doesn't have a quarantine room. Does not have a quarantine room. And questions about the deep grooves on the floorboards of the home. 200 years of people, or the 50 plus years of kids walking up and down these rows while this was a classroom. But look, some things you just can't explain. Certainly the enslaved people would have been involved in the construction of the house. He did hire a contractor. There's no question that they would have probably been involved in the building of this home. Uh, I know that's a common story with a connection to the house. Now, whether they put these skulls in there for whatever reasons, as a blessing to the house, we think, of course, immediately with a skull, it's probably more of a curse. We just don't know. We've never really been able to find any solid concrete evidence to prove one thing or another. Fearful fiction or fact? You decide. There's a lot to see even more to learn. Most importantly, the mansion may be filled with more history than haunts. Why is the state considered where slavery is outlawed, but yet individuals are still held in bondage? So in 1843, one of the Giro family slaves, Pete, will sue for his freedom. The significance of this case is by 1845, it's heard before the Illinois Supreme Court. And as a result of that case, not only does Pete, is Pete awarded his freedom, but it will forever close the loophole that existed for nearly 60 years, allowing individuals to still be held in bondage. Whatever haunts down here, I definitely disturb them.
Whoa. This has been a space that's been almost untouched for decades. Stories underneath the earth at Lent Brewery, a basement with an eerie feel. This is probably one of the more active spots in the brewery. Rumor has it down these flights of stairs await a few frights. I've had a couple of paranormal experiences down here. This place isn't accessible to the public, but we got a look with the help of Mark Farley, founder of the St. Louis Paranormal Research Society. He's seen some things down here he says he just can't explain. I was sweeping actually this row right here, and it walked right past this window. And it was, I, I, I thought it was the maintenance man. And I ran in here and no one was here. Mark says another time he was waiting down here to meet the owner of the building, but someone or something else showed up instead. And he came down the steps, he waved to me, and I was wearing a respirator at the time. I go, hey, I'll be there in a second. But then. What I saw, it wasn't him. And it was clear as day. Even more strange sightings in one of the oldest parts of the limp, dating back to 1840. I have been down here, heard things, seen things out of the corner of my eye. Mark has been spending a lot of time down here, cleaning out the space that's been shut off for decades because... I want to do seances down here. Okay. Yeah. All right. I don't know if we'll be back for that one. <laughs> Mark believes spirits are down here. Spirits, he says, could be former workers of the brewery or the international shoe company that took over once the brewery business tanked. There's something down here. There's something definitely down here.